Welcome to our class. We're teaching Bible analysis, how to understand the Bible. And tonight we're on lesson four. The lesson is entitled, The Christian's Present Rule and Order. <coughs> this is the fourth lesson in our study of Bible analysis. Previously, we learned the Bible is divided into two divisions, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ, as recorded in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, divided the Old Testament into three divisions. The Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Do you all remember that? Yes. There are three divisions to the New Testament. The historical books, the doctrinal books, and the prophetic book. Understanding the correct divisions of the Bible will help the Christian to avoid doctrinal error. <coughs> The Christian should read and study the entire Bible. However, that does not mean that Christians are to practice today everything that is taught in the Bible. Now, very often when I first say that in church or different places, people, boy, they raise up and they say, well, we're supposed to obey everything in the Bible. But then after they start finding out what it means about rightly dividing the word of truth, they find that that is a valid statement that I made. The understanding the correct divisions of the Bible will help the student to avoid doctrinal error. The Christian, as I said, should read and study the entire Bible. However, that does not mean that Christians are to practice today everything that is taught in the Bible. Most of the Old Testament, which consists of the Law of Moses and the Prophets, and some of the New Testament are not the present rule and guide for Christian practice today. Some of the teachings of the Old Testament and the New Testament are distinctly for certain people at certain times. That's why you have to read and say, who is it addressed to? <coughs> Christians today need to read and study the entire Bible, but that does not mean they are to practice everything that is taught in the entire Bible. The purpose for this lesson is to learn what the present rule and guide for Christians today is according to the Bible. The New Testament clearly teaches the law of Moses and the prophets are not to be guides for Christian faith and practice today. In other words, Christians are not to do everything that is commanded in the Old Testament. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 17, on your lesson manuscript we have that, so for time we're going to just read it from here. But I do encourage you and ask you that when you get home, find these passages in the Bible. Remember what I told you? The more you use the Bible, the more you'll be familiar with knowing where certain books in the Bible are. And so when you get home, find these passages, read them, maybe highlight them if you so desire, and uh, you'll be more, get more familiar with the Bible by doing that. But for sake of time, we're going to read it from the manuscript. In Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 14 and continuing through verse 17, we read, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. In verse 14 of Colossians chapter 2, we read that Jesus Christ blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that is against us that are Christians, when he died as the sinner's substitute on the cross. To blot out means to remove. The ordinances he removed as a rule of faith and practice. Now what am I saying? He marked them out, he blotted them out as a rule of faith and practice, which means that they're not what we're under. For New Testament Christians are found in the law of Moses and in the prophets. Included in these ordinances that are against us are the Ten Commandments. There are also dietary restrictions, our laws in the Law of Moses that Christians are not now commanded to abide by. 
There are laws in the Old Testament concerning the keeping of the Sabbath day or days that Christians are not now instructed to abide by. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, or, I'm sorry, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning with verse 7 and going through verse 11, we read, but if the ministration of death, that is the administration of death, written and engraven in stones, now that's important that you notice that, written and engraven in stones is a reference to the Ten Commandments. If the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For the ministration of condemnation be glorious, if the ministration of condemnation be glorious, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, notice something was done away, if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Death, capital punishment, was the penalty for breaking any of the Ten Commandments. If you broke any one of those Ten Commandments under that dispensation in that period of time, the penalty for that was death. Verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, refers to the Ten, Ten Commandments when it says written and engraven in stones. The verse also mentions the children of Israel. The Bible is clear, and many other passages confirm the Ten Commandments were for the children of Israel, and the penalty for breaking any of the commandments was death. Church 11, uh, verse 11, unmistakably says the Ten Commandments were done away as being a rule and guide for Christians to live by today. Now very often when people hear that for the first time, their feathers rile up when they say, you mean we're not under the Ten Commandments? Many people are startled when they hear that Christians are no longer under any of the law, including the Ten Commandments, as a rule and guide for Christian living today. However, that is exactly what the New Testament repeatedly says. The law of Moses was given exclusively to the Jews as a rule and guide for practice in view of the coming Messiah. Now I am going to ask you to get your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And I want you to look at verse 1. Exodus is the second book in the Old Testament. Go, go to Exodus chapter 20. And let me see if you can read. Secondly, if you can believe what you read. If you can read and believe what you read, you're going to understand what I'm trying to say tonight. In Exodus chapter 20, look at verse number 1. Exodus chapter 20, look at verse number 1. I want you to find it. You may want to highlight it. You want, may want to mark it. Exodus 20, look at verse number 1. Notice, and God spake all these words, saying, now who is speaking? God. Verse 2, I am the Lord uh, thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, who is he writing to? Not just what it says, don't add anything else to it. He's writing to those that were in bondage in Egypt, right? Yes. Now let me ask you a question. Were you, how many of you have ever been to Egypt? Okay, how many of you were ever a slave in, in Egypt? That's what bondage means. Okay, so uh, Brother Duran in the back, he went to Egypt, but you weren't a slave there. Now notice who it says it's written to. I'm the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then it goes on and it lists the Ten Commandments. I want you to look now down at verse number 22. Verse 22. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Now, who did God tell Moses it was addressed to? Now, can you read that? Okay. Can you believe that? Yes. Now, let me ask you then. If you were never a slave in Egypt, and if you are not one of the children of Israel, the Jews, is this are the Ten Commandments for you? No. Who were they addressed to? The Jews, right? All right. Let's go on and say, well, you don't make a doctrine from one passage or one verse. Let's see what else we say. Back to your manuscript. God is speaking to Moses, and he tells him to speak unto the children of Israel. And that what God said? Mm -hmm. The message that God gave Moses to speak was, was for whom? It was for the children of Israel. Is that not clear? Mm -hmm. The chapter concludes by saying, the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Clearly, the law of Moses was for who? The Jews. Is that not clearly what the Bible says? Yes. So don't leave here and say, Dr. Tisdale said this. I'm just telling you that's what the Bible says. The Old Testament prophets wrote to admonish and instruct the Jews. Malachi told the Jews to remember ye the law of Moses my servant which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Now I want you to find the book of Malachi in the Old Testament. The book of Malachi is just before Matthew. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. So it's uh, oh, about two-thirds of the way through the Bible. And I want you to find the book of Malachi. And I want you to look so you can see what God says. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4 beginning with verse, or looking at verse number 4. Notice what it says. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for who? <laughs> for all Israel. For all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. <laughs> Isn't that what it clearly says? The law of Moses was for who? It was for the Jews. That's what the Bible clearly says. Back to your manuscript. Many of the principles that guided the lives of the Jews are still operative today. However, they are operative today not because they are written in the Law of Moses or in the Prophets, but because they are written in the Psalms and the New Testament. In many cases, the Law of Christ as found in the New Testament, is much stricter than the law of Moses. One major difference is that the penalty for breaking the law of Moses was death, and that is not so with the law of Christ. And all I can say is glory to God, hallelujah, Amen. praise God. Aren't you glad today that when you sin, the penalty is not being put to death by stoning? In Exodus chapter 20, verse number 13, the commandment was to not kill or commit murder. The penalty for committing murder under the law of Moses was death. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ gave his law, referred to as the law of Christ. Under the law of Christ, it is still wrong to commit murder. However, the law of Christ is much narrower than the law of Moses. Under the law of Christ, the Christian is judged not by just what he does, by, but by his heart attitude or what he thinks. And so the law of Christ is much stricter than the law of Moses. But under the law of Moses, if you committed a sin, if you committed murder, you were put to death by stoning. But in the New Testament, we're going to see that the Lord Jesus, the penalty has been removed, putting, you're not stoned to death, but notice what 
Jesus said, it's not just the act of murder, but the intent of murder in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 contains what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And is the moral, spiritual, and ethical standards that the Lord Jesus expects Christians, those members of his kingdom, to live by. And during the millennial reign of Christ, when Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years, it will be the absolute law. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, listen to the words of Jesus. Ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Now, the Old Testament said, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that's the Lord Jesus giving his law, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell. In the Old Testament, you had to commit murder. But Jesus said, in the New Testament, if you have hatred towards your brother in your heart, without a cause, it's the same as murder. So it's much stricter than the Old Testament. Again, a major difference between the law of Moses and the law of Christ is that the capital penalty punishment was removed for violators of the law of Christ. Praise the Lord. Read what Paul wrote concerning murder in Romans chapter 13, verse 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandments, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <coughs> the point the Christian should recognize is that murder is still wrong today. <coughs> Not because the Ten Commandments are forbidden, but because the law of Christ, as recorded in the New Testament, forbids it. As we go through this lesson, you'll see why it's important to make that distinction. Someone may ask, well, what difference does it make what law is used for teaching that murder is wrong? If the law of Moses said murder is wrong, or if the law of Christ said the murder is wrong, somebody says, well, what difference does it make which law you use? It makes much difference for the Bible teacher or student who wants to intelligently teach the Bible and use it as an arsenal against doctrinal heresy. There are absolutely no contradictions in the Bible when it is rightly divided. There are contradictions in the Bible and confusion will result if one tries to teach it and does not rightly divide it. If one places himself under the law of Moses, he places himself under the penalty of death for breaking Moses' law. Also, it becomes impossible to intelligently and accurately teach the Bible, if one teaches Christians are under part of Moses' law, but not under every part of Moses' law. The Bible student can also compare Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, with Matthew chapter 27 and 28. In Exodus chapter 20 it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay? That's the law of Moses. But notice the law of Christ. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So notice the law of Moses, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But he added to it and said, In your heart, if you looked after a woman, for instance, and committed adultery, you committed adultery in your heart if you lusted after her. The principle is stated, as stated above is the same. Adultery was wrong under the law of Moses. The penalty for committing adultery under Moses' law was death. Adultery is still wrong under the law of Christ. In fact, the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ are much stricter than the teachings of Moses on adultery. Christ's law considers more than the actual sin itself. It looks at the heart. 
One who lusts after someone in his or her heart is guilty of adultery under the law of Christ. Moses' law required that the physical act must have been committed for a sin to have occurred. However, there is no death penalty for committing adultery under the law of Christ as there was under the law of Moses. The soul, meaning only guide for the Christian faith in action today, is the Psalms and the New Testament. Remember, the Psalms are the five poetical books. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is the inaugural address by the Lord Jesus Christ to His church and is the law of Christ. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, referring to the law of Moses, or the prophets, the 17 Old Testament books written by prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said He did not come to the earth to do away with the law of Moses. He came to fulfill the law of Moses. Jesus continued by saying, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth shall pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law of Moses, till all be fulfilled. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Christ came to fulfill the law. He came to do what no man had been able to do, and that is to never break any part of the law of Moses. In order for one to not break the law of Moses, one would could not have inherited Adam's sin nature and would also have to keep the law flawlessly. Jesus Christ could meet those requirements, and only Jesus Christ could do that. Because he was virgin born, he did not inherit the old sin nature that has been passed down from one person to the next through the Father for 6,000 years. Jesus stated the law of Moses would be in effect until it was fulfilled. When he was nailed to the cross, he fulfilled the law of Moses. And according to Colossians chapter 2, with verses 14 through 17 that we read earlier, all of the law of Moses was done away with as a rule and guide for Christians living when Christ was nailed to the cross. Please read Luke chapter 16, verse 16, and it's written on your manuscript. The law and the prophets were until John. Now I put in bold print and underlined that and put it in italics. Right here. The law and the prophets, what does it say? Were until John. Clearly, the law of Moses and the prophets were in effect as a rule and guide for living until the time of John the Baptist. John the Baptist preached that the Old Testament system of worshiping and serving God, the religion of Judaism, was ending and that there would be a new system of worshiping and serving God. The new system would be the New Testament church, the church started by Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, as foretold by the Old Testament prophets, would prepare the way for Christ to come and start his church. So notice it says very clearly, the law, that's the law of Moses, and the prophets were until John. Does that not compare with the other scriptures that they were done away with? Read Galatians chapter 3, verses 10, 13, and 19 through 29. We're going to read some of them here, but I'd like you in your Bibles to read those when you get home. But notice what it says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse of the law. Now that's important to understand. If you place yourself on any of the Old Testament laws, you place them under any of them, that means you're under the curse of the law, which means the death penalty. For it is written in the book of the law to do them. Verse 10. Moses wrote that anyone who is under any part of the law of Moses is under the curse of Moses' law, death. In verse 13, he continues, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, 
being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Amen. So the Lord Jesus Christ, when He died on Calvary's cross, paid the penalty for our sins and the sins of all the world. And as a result of that, we should thank Him continuously Amen. for what He did for us. And accept the gift of eternal life that He offers us. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross and purchased redemption for all who would believe by shedding His precious blood and rising from the grave. The curse or penalty for breaking the law of Moses was death, and Christ paid the penalty. He died on the cross. In verse 19, Paul asked the question, Wherefore then serveth the law? If Jesus has paid the penalty for your sins, why do you want to place yourself back under the law? And that's a good question for any of us. If Jesus, when He died on the cross, paid the penalty of death, why do any of us want to go and place ourselves back under the law? You say, well, I'm not doing it. Well, many, if you're trying to live by the Ten Commandments and say they're my rule, that's what you're doing. We'll explain that more as we go on. He is asking a very logical question to the Galatians. Why would anyone want to return to the law of Moses since Christ has made it possible for man to not have to be under Moses' law? In verse 24, Paul writes, The law of Moses was man's school teacher to bring him to Christ so that he could be saved from the penalty of the law, that is, death. Therefore, the law of Moses and the prophets are not a rule and guide for New Testament Christians. In no place does the Bible say that the Psalms, the five poetical books of the Old Testament, had fulfilled their purpose or that they were to last only until the Lord Jesus Christ had abolished them. In fact, the apostles taught Christians were to teach and admonish one another in the Psalms. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Now notice, that's under one of the doctrinal books. That's the division of doctrinal book. And Paul is writing, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So we can use the psalms for use in our worship services. So they're still in effect today. He instructed, that is Paul the Galatians, Colossians, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so we should sing to the Lord. In fact, I sometimes see in the church service, you know, I'm sitting up on the platform and looking out, and there's some people there, uh, when we're singing congregational hymns, they won't sing at all. They just sort of cross their arms and say, I double dog dare you to bless me. Like a bullfrog right there. That's true. But the Bible says we're to sing. We're commanded to sing. And we're to sing unto the Lord. And there's nothing to me much beautiful than great congregational singing. Paul even commended the Corinthians for having a psalm when they come together to worship in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, Let all things be done unto edify. Now the Campbellites, do you know what the Campbellites, who the Campbellites are? No. Does anybody in here know who the Campbellites are? Oh yeah, the church. Okay, you're going to learn tonight. <laughs> The Campbellites, they were followers of Alexander Campbell, are now known as the Church of Christ. You know what the Church of Christ is, don't you? Originally they were called Campbellites. And many of us old-time Baptists still refer to them as Campbellites because they were started by Alexander Campbellton. Hamil uh, Campbell. Holy the Campbellites, followers of Alexander Campbell, known uh, today as the Church of Christ, erred in their teachings by not recognizing the five poetical books, the Psalms as a present rule and guide for Christian living. They say we're only under the New Testament. They falsely teach 
that Christians should not use any musical instruments in their worship services. However, the psalm specifically authorizes the use of musical instruments in worship, and the New Testament endorses and admonishes the teaching of the psalms. Now let me just say concerning the Campbellites. Very often they'll say, well, in the New Testament it doesn't say that we're to uh, use a piano, an organ, or a musical instrument. And I say, does the New Testament say we're supposed to use air conditioning? <laughs> does the New Testament say we're to have church pews? Does the New Testament say we're to have song books? No, it doesn't. Does the New Testament even say that we're to have a church building to meet in? No, no it doesn't. But I tell you, I like air conditioning. <laughs> And I like having song books. And I do not like having comfortable pews or chairs to sit in. And I like it much better to have a place of worship, a church that we can go to, instead of us all having to meet in someone's home. Because most of our homes would not be big enough to be able to take care of everyone. And so just because the Bible doesn't say specifically you uh, have to have a, you can use a piano or an organ, there's many things the Bible doesn't say we can use. For instance, the Bible doesn't mention anything about Sunday school. The Bible doesn't say anything about Sunday school literature. The Bible doesn't say anything about gospel tracts. But all of those are good tools to get the gospel out and to fulfill the Great Commission. The Bible specifically states the law of Moses and the prophets would only remain the rule and guide for God's people until the time of John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. However, there is never even suggestion that the Psalms, the five political books, would cease to be a rule and guide for the New Testament believers. The general divisions of the Bible, when rightly divided, enable men to teach, preach, and testify in a way that they need never to be ashamed, 2 Timothy 2.15. Serious doctrinal errors will result when men do not recognize the general Bible division. 